Margaret, you're good to go. Okay, great. Um, good evening. My name is Margaret Hefferly. I'm the chair of the Regional Family Support Planning Council Number One, which covers Morris County, Sussex County, and Warren counties. And I have two other council members that are here to support me, and there may be more on, but just two that will appear on screen. Um, and that's uh, Mercedes uh, Wytowski, sorry, and Gabrielle Bohan. Um, so just want to briefly say that um, the Family Support Council is the voice of families within the IDD system. Um, established through the Family Support Act of 1993. And the council's role is threefold, to provide information to families in events like these, to gather input from families about their experiences and services that they may be looking for, and then to advocate um, to the state, uh, both to the Division of Children and Families and to DDD. Um, so uh, you may want to, you know, I know you might be from different areas, but um, when we introduce the various councils, you may want to send them an email and ask to be on their uh, mailing list. So I just want to uh, throw this over to Mercedes Witowski, who is the executive director of the New Jersey Division no, Council Div Developmental, Developmental Disabilities <laughs> Council. Sorry, I didn't have the prompt. That's okay. Thanks, Margaret. Um, did you want to put up the slides now? Sure. Or, um, so I just want to welcome all of you um, on behalf of the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities, um, where I also happen to be the executive director and um, Council One, where I live in Morris County. Um, uh, I have a daughter with disabilities who lives at home with me. And um, I relied on the Family Support Planning Council for many, many years um, as a parent, um, and then through the work of learning about um, being a parent, uh, I became executive director of the council about five years ago. Um, the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities is one of 56 councils across states and the U.S. territories, um, and we are established and authorized through the Federal Developmental Disabilities Act. So if you live in New Jersey, you have the New Jersey Council, but if you go to any other state or six US territories, there's a Council on Developmental Disabilities in, in all other states. And the basic role of the council through the federal authorization is to um, be that voice um, for families, for individuals, um, self-advocates, um, and then also work in collaboration with public and private agencies to ensure that the services and supports that people with disabilities and their families need are what they get. So as you can imagine, in each state, it's going to be a little different. But in New Jersey, our focus is on what's happening um, at the state level that we can um, um, provide input. Um, tonight's an opportunity for that to ensure that what's working continues to work and what isn't working, um, we advocate for, for changes either in legislation or in regulation policy at the state level. So again, I welcome you here. I'm proud that to be a member of the New Jersey Council on Developmental Disabilities and also Council One. Back to you, Margaret. Okay. And then I wanna introduce Gabrielle Bohan, who is uh, also a vice chair of Council One. And you can see the screen with the various councils there. And Gabrielle's gonna talk about council membership. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and uh, thank you to Mercedes. Uh, so yes, count, the Regional Family Support Planning Council, Council One, as you can see on the map, we cover uh, Morris, Warren, Sussex, um, but there are regional councils throughout New Jersey. And we are family members of, of loved ones with developmental disabilities and individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and as, again, as Margaret said, we are here to gather information and hopefully uh, use the information that we gather from you, the families who are here, the ones that we talk to through our outreaches and through your responses to our surveys 
um, and attending our meetings. And we use that information when we sit with um, various other state officials. Um, I'm going to mention that the Regional Family Support Planning Council has quite a few subcommittees, one of which is the Family Advisory Committee that um, meets with representatives from DDD. But we also have the, um, the DCF Collaboration Committee, the Division of Children and Families Collaboration Committee. And we meet with representatives from the Children's System of Care, as well as other representatives from Reform Care. The council is here. The best thing about joining the council is you get to meet other people. You get to meet other families. You hear what that what they have to say, and you get to make a difference um, towards the policies that affect our children. I have a 24 year old daughter with Down syndrome, who might be busting in the door any minute now, um, and um, it's it's a way of trying to get our voices heard. We have done many things, collaborating with other groups um, through the past couple of years. Some of the achievements that we've done were uh, working on the bill to get our kids an extra year to in school um, for the kids uh, because of COVID and our children weren't receiving all the services. We worked on trying to make the path from perform care into the adult world into the Division of Developmental Disabilities by eliminating some of the paperwork and making the application process easier to go from one system to another. We also work for getting the parents paid during COVID who are taking care of their loved ones on the DDD side. So by being part of council, you have a voice in what's changing and you have a, access to people who can make those policy changes. So I wish you consider joining Council One meets on on Tuesdays, the third Tuesday of the month, and we are in the Wegmans in East Hanover. I call it Persephone, but it's off Route 10. And, um, but we are also hybrid because we realize that our people up in Sussex County and Warren, it's a little bit of a distance, but we welcome you to be part of our council. We wanna hear what's happening in all three of our counties. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. And I'm gonna let Margaret, um, go on with the presentation and talk about perform care. Thank okay, you. terrific. Just want to reiterate that, you know, when you get on the website, if you click on the links for your council, ask to be added to their mailing list. We always mail out um, notifications of our meetings. We do not meet in December, uh, but we'll be back in January. And we also um, send other upcoming events and other webinars and things like that that help families. And, and that's the other thing is being a part of the council, you really get to learn how to navigate the system because it ain't easy. So uh, moving on. So one of the things we're gonna talk about um, or this presentation is going to talk about, I will mention some of the services available to families through Perform Care, but this is mostly about applying for eligibility. Um, so uh, Gabrielle met, you know, mentioned we do monthly meetings. We have, we've got, we meet a lot. We've got regular um, chair phone calls. We have quarterly statewide forms that we also invite families to. So if you're on your mail, on the mailing list, you will get notices of those uh, meetings. Um, and again, she mentioned the local meetings are mostly held mo monthly, um, statewide meetings, quarterly, chair meetings, uh, the family advisory committee. That is where we have a seat at the table with the assistant commissioner of DDD, which provides adult services to people with developmental disabilities over the age of 21. Then again, the System of Care Collaboration Committee. So you bet, you know, we're going to get any input and bring it back to that table as well. Um, we've got the PR Strategies Committees, uh, you know, trying to do public relations, the Health and Safety Committee, which, you know, developed a white paper recently for people who are living with um, assistance from DDD and group homes. So your local chair and vice chair for your Family Support Planning Council are your link um, to a lot of these things. Okay, so a long time ago, all individuals with uh, developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities were served by the Division 
of Developmental Disabilities, or DDD, under the Department of Human Services. In 2013, that's 10 years ago, they moved children out of DDD into a new program called the Children's System of Care. I know you hear a lot of acronyms. This is, you know, CSOC is what that's called, uh, but we'll try not to use too many here. But then, so CSOC is within the Department of Children and Families, and they combined the Division of Child Behavioral Health and children with developmental disabilities. One of the challenges is that the child behavioral health is what they were used to doing, and they're pretty good at it, uh, but it's taken them quite some time to get to know our families. Um, you know, a developmental disability could be Down syndrome, could be autism, cerebral palsy, cognitive uh, impairment. You know, it lasts a lot longer, and it may have a, a much greater impact, um, a long-term impact. Um, oftentimes, and uh, the next slide will show, if you enter the system through child behavioral health, it's short term. It's kind of a crisis situation, often putting out fires. And then from the day they enter, they're planning their exit. So our system provides services that will continue uh, because families, you know, have, have struggled. So perform care is called the system administrator of the children's system of care. But quite frankly, they're the only people that parents talk to. They're the ones that handle the application. They're the ones that take requests for services. Um, so, you know, they're the ones that, that's the name that families know, perform care. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, intellectual and development disability services are a little different. And um, so, you know, they developed a little system of services that's separate, which also saddles us with a complicated application. But the good news is you only have to apply once. So a little flow chart of, um, of the Department of Children and Families, but, you know, there we are, the Division of, uh, I'm sorry, the Division of Children's System of Care, um, right there in the middle. And then um, just below are some of the partners in the system. The uh, CMO or care management organization for our area, it's called Caring Partners. Um, when things are difficult and you've contacted Perform Care, they will may well open you up to the care management organization and they'll help partner and come to your home and help with some of those things. Mobile response is an, somewhat an emergency thing that you can call. And both of those are often involved with kids with emotional or behavioral concerns. Um, community providers, ones who help uh, cover respite and things like that, and the family support organization. All these were here before, and so they're still getting to know some of our families and, and some of our issues. So, um, and one thing I want to say, if your child has a developmental disability, then you need to click on the Intellectual and Developmental Disability Services tab on the Perform Care website. I'm sure they will put the Perform Care website in the chat. Um, there's an eligibility application that is lengthy and requires a lot of documentation to assess the level of functioning and impact of the disability on the child. Um, why is it needed? These services are not an entitlement. This is an eligibility program. So you need to provide that documentation to show that A, your child has a developmental disability and B, it is impactful. impactful. Um, one of the things is even though Perform Care can supply services up to your 21st year when DDD takes over, for applications, they are only having people apply from zero to 17 years of age. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but um, the idea is at 18, you could apply directly to DDD. Quite right? frankly, it's a little easier application, but um, then once you're found eligible, because the eligibility criteria is the same, then you would you know, get be found eligible from DDD and then, um, and then go back to perform care with the eligibility letter and receive those services. It's a meeting, Pat. Sorry. So like I said, the eligibility criteria is the same for both programs, 
so uh, I'm not able to see. Um, but basically, at least three of these listed areas of need, um, you have to be to found be found eligible. So that's that you need help with self care, that you have language or communication difficulties, you have learning difficulties, you have mobility issues, um, your capacity for self direction isn't what it should be, uh, your capacity for independent living and your capacity for economic self-sufficiency is also limited. I'm going to, um, so well, so youth with, if you are old, kind of like us, and you applied for DDD years ago before 2013, you may well have been given a presumptive eligibility. So you won't need to completely apply reapply for services, you um, could contact DDD at the intake number below 973-927-2600 and ask them, you know, you'll give your child's name and birth date and things like that and see if they have a copy of an eligibility letter. And then you could share that with Perform Care and then just uh, provide, you know, some of the other services they need, family support, uh, application. I'm just going to mention, because I did mention that, you know, we're not affiliated with the Department of Children and Families, and we, you know, aren't involved in the services. So um, I'm just going to mention them here so that everybody knows what we're talking about. So uh, family support services is for someone who, who lives with their child in the community, and um, a number of them, oops, sorry. Um, one of the biggest ones is respite care, which is providing care for your child to give parents a break from caregiving. And there are a number of ways it's delivered. It can be agency hired respite, people who have training to help fit people with developmental disabilities, self-hired respite, where you can hire someone that you know and trust. And they do have to get a little background check and things like that, but then it's a reimbursement model. So then um, the agency will reimburse you for the hours. Usually you get allotted 20 hours a month and then um, they will pay you whatever that rate is. Um, agency after school care, if, the, if there's an after school program, agency weekend recreation, some of the agencies have nice Saturday drop-offs with a lot of activities and also evening um, ones that are uh, called parents night out. Um, and then there's also uh, overnight respite. Also included in family support services, educational advocacy, assistive technology, environmental modifications. And um, if you know if you, if you need that, but so that's just some of those services. And then I will just add for intellectual and developmental disability services, unlike um, from the support services, there could be uh, intensive in-home services, clinical and therapeutic interventions. I will say for the most part, Perform Care does not provide ABA since that is covered through uh, insurance. Um, individual support services with help for activities of daily living. Um, yeah. And the only other one is also summer camp. They will fund up to two weeks of summer day camp or one week of a sleepaway camp. So that was just an introduction to some of the services that may be available to your child. So uh, preparation is key. Um, it can be a little challenging uh, doing, there's an online portal where you can do an application and upload documentation, or um, there's a paper application. You can print it out yourself and fill it out. You can call Perform Care and ask them to send you one. Um, and you really always want to make sure that you send copies, never the originals, particularly if you're mailing them. And if um, if you're applying on paper, I would keep a copy of the whole um, application in case something's missing. So what you will need, a copy of your child's birth certificate or valid U.S. passport, uh, any documentation that shows that they have residency in New Jersey, um, Parents' birth certificate, my understanding is that it, uh, in terms of citizenship, it's either the parent or the child, but not both. 
um, then uh, medical reports documenting the disability. And this is really important. It is very hard to get into doctor's offices such as neurologists or developmental pediatricians. So if you're seeing one now, keep seeing them periodically because you're gonna not only need this to apply for performed care, but at 18, you're gonna need some of this stuff too. And these documents can't be really old. Also school reports documenting the disability. Every year there's an IEP meeting and the teachers and therapists discuss how your child has progressed uh, on their goals for their IEP and how they've compared to last year. Every three years, there's an opportunity to get a reevaluation or a triennial uh, evaluation. The district must ask for your consent to do these evaluations and you should consent because it's a great way to find out how your child is doing. Because unlike comparing them on their goals to the IEP for the triennial or the reeval, they're comparing your child to a non-disabled child. So that's where we're gonna see the areas of need and the impact of the disability. So every three years it comes up, I would sign off for all of them. Even if the district says, we know he's still gonna qualify for an IEP, we don't need to put him through that and do all that trouble. So just sign here. And what you don't realize is you're waiving your rights to those reports, which can be very important to you. Okay, sorry, my screen. Um, so this was kind of new to me, but apparently your child must be registered with Perform Care in order to access the family portal or what they're now calling the cyber portal. So that means you have to call Perform Care to register your child over the phone so that you can get um, a cyber ID, which is an ID number. So you need to call that number. The good news is they're um, open 24 hours. So hopefully you're not up all hours, but um, so you need to register your child first by phone. Um, and here's the other challenge. Um, you cannot apply online using a Mac and you cannot really apply successfully via a cell phone. So ideally we're talking about a desktop um, using Microsoft or quite honestly, I mean, back when I had to do DDD, I printed that whole thing out and I carried it with me and each day I filled in a little. Um, so, you know, however you choose to, to do the application, um, it's just gonna be a step-by-step -step process. So um, that is the link for um, the family portal, or you can request um, a paper application through Perform Care. And the application includes this list. And I am going to talk a little bit about what Form A is. So it is the, um, it's just the basic information, your name, your address, your contact information, uh, proof of citizenship for the parent or the child, not both, uh, proof of residency, your doctor's contact information, insurance information, whether your child is receiving supplemental security income. Um, again, your doctor's information, um, school information. They want the IE, whether your child has an IEP and what their IEP classification is, and then whether they're receiving occupational therapy, speech therapy, phys uh, physical therapy, or counseling. So, um, you know, that's all information. For the most part, you kind of should be able to have at hand. Um, the next form is the Child Adaptive Behavior Summary. Now, strangely enough, everybody seems to think it's like a functional behavioral assessment. It's not. This form, Form B, should be filled out by the primary care teacher, the parent, you, who know your child's best. And they're going to be asking a lot of questions about what your child can and can't do versus, uh, based on their activities of daily living. So basically it's a check mark across one through five. My child can do that, no problem, it's completely alone and your child needs physical help to do that. So it asks specific questions about eating and drinking. It asks questions about toileting. It asks questions about hygiene, shower, bathing, toothbrushing, shaving. It asks questions about dressing. It asks questions about communication. It asks questions about behaviors and uh, other skills lumped together. 
They also ask about community awareness. Um, they ask about medical conditions. Uh, they ask about behavioral risks. So again, these are all these checklists about how much help they need. They ask about trauma. They ask about mental health concerns. Um, and then there's a separate section um, based on the needs for adaptive equipment um, or whether your child use, uses environmental modification. So if they're in a wheelchair, do you need ramps? Do you need lifts? Do you need a wheelchair accessible van? Do you need a wheelchair accessible bathrooms like doorways widened and things like that? Um, Form C is a document documentation checklist cover sheet that shows that you're, you know, making sure you're handing everything in. Uh, Form D is HIPAA privacy acknowledgement. You're signing that you agree to their privacy practices. Um, and then the final one, uh, a third party release. So if you're giving the name to the doctor that they can contact the doctor. And then um, there's also a readiness checklist. So um, the online application is the fastest. It says it takes 60 days. I've known it to take longer. Uh, once that is completely submitted, um, currently you can't do the application with a Mac. Um, with a Mac. You can start and then save the application and reopen the app any as many times as you need until it's finished. But until you have everything in it and all the documents uploaded, you should not submit the documents um, because you know they you'll you'll hear from them. Um, and that's a good thing. So once submitted, the application will time out from one year from the date that it was submitted. And if your application does time out, you cannot do another one online. You'll have to do the paper application. So Perform Care will contact you, I believe by letter for any missing information. And you really wanna make sure you get it to them so your application is complete. Quite frankly, I'd be calling every couple of weeks to say, do you have everything you need? Did you receive my application? Is anything missing? Uh, because you really, you know, you just don't want this to take more time than you need. And, you know, as I mentioned, you only have to apply once. You don't have to request any services and, and nobody will force them on you. So it's a good idea to do, you know, to do the application before you need it. Because, you know, if you do need something and you wind up in crisis, you know, you're not going to be prepared to have access to all the services that you need. Um, a good time to do the application is when your child study team does a reevaluation or a triennial. We already talked about this. And this is the uh, uh, collaboration committee, the DCF collaboration committee got the um, DCF to tie this so that it used to be that the the timelines for the documents were much shorter, but we got them to release, uh, to raise them to, you know, certain documents only need, can be three years old. So that, you know, right away, if you don't know, I'd say tomorrow, call your child's case manager, find out when your last reevaluation was. And as long as those, those reports are less than three years old, you should be able to use them from the application. Um, as I mentioned, so you need to do that written consent to do those reevaluations every three years. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't waive that right. I would do it because you'll need this, like I said, not only for the perform care application, but when your child turns 18, if they're going to need to apply for more services, such as supplemental security income, um, guardianship, um, and the Division of Developmental Disabilities. So, um, you know, you need that documentation from your doctor. So, you know, you should... Uh, schedule those appointments accordingly. Um, this is the acceptable time frame for the application. So the younger your child is, the shorter time frame they want those documents because ch children change so much in, in you know when they're growing. But you know through that five to eight, 18 years um, of age, you have three months for all those um, you know doctors' reports. And some of those other things, and um, and then twelve months again, um, the adaptive behavior assessment is completed by you. I, so I would do that last, um, and it's very important 
that you don't have your proud mom or dad hat on, that you think critically about what your child can do without any help or you know what help they do need, uh, because this is going to help determine their eligibility for the program. Okay, so we talked about um, this step, you know, making copies. Don't, you, you know, if you're doing the cyber portal, you can upload the documents, but if you're gonna be dropping them in the mail, you don't wanna give originals and you do wanna have a whole copy of your entire application. Um, so it's a little tricky, the list of tests they accept. I think you'll see it on another slide, but when you get those evaluation reports, they're a little tricky. There's a lot of scores and numbers and ranges and things like that, but they will mention the tool that they use to do those, um, those evaluations, particularly educational ones. So you should see one of those on the acceptable list that we'll talk about. So again, you know, we talked about residency, uh, proof of age, uh, citizenship, uh, diagnosis of an intellectual or developmental disability, school evaluation reports, um, and assessment for adaptive devices or equipment if needed. Um, these are the list of some of those uh, tests that you will see on those reports from the school. So it's a good idea to do them. It's a good idea you know, to get and keep copies um, because they'll be helpful to you over time. Okay, again, the adaptive behavior summary is filled out by you. Uh, be critical. Think of your child on their worst day, not their best day. Um, and think about how their behavior interferes with them doing the task, even if they physically can do it. But you think about with if you're not getting cooperation, um, you know, how long and how hard it makes accomplishing some of those tasks. And again, um, since it needs to be less than six month olds when submitted, you should do the adaptive behavior summary last. Um, okay, I'm repeating myself. Um, send the original application forms and copies of the necessary documentation um, you know, to perform care. I'd send it certified. Um, but again, the good news is the backup you have is that you saved a whole copy of the application so that if, if it gets lost in the mail, you're set. Um, so, you know, again, um, uh, they will check for the necessary documents and they will contact you, but I contact them every couple of weeks to make sure they have everything. Um, send, they will send it to the DDD eligibility unit for review. I'm not sure that 60 days is current, but um, here's hoping. Um, and then the eligibility letter comes from Perform Care. Um, if your child does not appear to be eligible, a second review is completed, which may extend the 60 day period. And at that point, if you can bring any new information to the table, I would do that. Um, so we talked about um, some of those services. So when you would like to request family support services, um, you will need to do a, a a phone consultation and they will do an assessment. I know it sounds weird, but to see how stressed you are and how difficult things are. And then based on, um, you know, you're already found eligible for services, um, but based on the availability and the type of respite you've chosen and the need, um, you know, you, hopefully that will be granted. Um, summer camp, there's so much information on the website about summer camp and summer camp applications are open now. So historically, you would start looking at some of these special needs camps that are certified with Perform Care and um, try to set aside a week, talk to the camp and say, oh, we'd like you know our kid to go the last week of August. And then um, when the money came down for camp, which was usually May or June, then you would make the application to Perform Care. But my understanding is it's all open now. So the first step, uh, once you're eligible is to look at the camps on their list. Um, so, you know, they have some behavioral supports. They do have residential services if needed and out of home treatment if needed. Um, and as I mentioned, if the application is approved, so say you asked for agency respite or even self-directed respite, it will still be 
assigned to a, a services provider who will then contact you. Um, so, um, and then they will have the funding to uh, reimburse you if you're doing that self-directed respite. Okay, so I think we're at the point. Uh, we didn't wanna keep you too long tonight, but we do wanna hear from you. Um, any questions or um, hear about your experiences, um, we're here. All right, we have one question in the box, Margaret. My daughter has ADHD with NVLD and want to get ABA therapy for her. What should we do related to that? What was the second thing, that acronym? That I don't know. N um, N V. I think it's not nonverbal learning disability. I think Thank you, um, Mercedes. That's okay. Typically, uh, ABA is usually only available through your insurance with an autism diagnosis, but I would call your uh, insurance company, request a care manager, and see if, even if you couldn't get ABA directly, if they had any kind of uh, behavioral supports or counseling or things like that, that might be available. So um, Laura's hand is raised. Um, so we're going to allow her to ask her question. So if so, your option now is to type your question in the Q&A or raise your hand. We'll ask you to unmute and to um, ask your question. So Laura, you've been asked to unmute. You can unmute and ask your question. Uh, and, sorry, I don't think I raised my hand. Oh, okay. Nope. Then you can unraise it. Um, and just remember this session is being recorded. So I would advise people to not include very personal information um, because it, you know, the, the uh, recording will be made available to others who have not participated as well. Elizabeth Ellison, you have your hand up. We can ask you to unmute. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, I have just a quick question. So uh, one of the things that I'm looking for for my son, uh, my son is five, he's turning six next month, um, has autism. Um, I have scheduled a, just a refresher IEP. I'm not familiar with the IEP um, structure at his new school. And I was looking online and saw that there was um, advocacy people that can kind of come in and sit with you as a non-experienced parent. And is that something that I would be, th that this perform care would offer? Or is that something I could find prior to finding out if I'm eligible for that or not? Does that make sense? Yes. So um, there are actually a number of places that you can get IEP advocacy. I would suggest, and I'm hoping we could put it in the chat, you go to SPAN and I'm going to mess this up. This it used to be called Statewide Parent Advocacy Network. I think it's, okay. um, and they are the Parent Training and Information Center, federally designated for the state of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, and they do technical assistance um, for uh, people with IEPs. And they have great videos, um, really great videos that you can learn a lot. And then they also do trainings that you can sign up for. There's one that's called Basic Rights and Special Education. Um, so you could do that. Um, do you have a case manager? I do. Special Child Health Services? Um, well, I have somebody designated from his school district. So I don't know if that's I, something yeah. different you're nope, talking about. that's not gonna help. <laughs> okay. But you, you would be eligible having a child with autism to get a special, a special child health services case manager. Um, and all you need to do is call. And who do I, and what, who do I call? What county? Uh, we're in Gloucester County. Gloucester. Uh, could somebody look that up? Hang on. Uh, you, you know, if the registration was done, you should have gotten a phone call. Let's see. How about we, while we're searching for that, Elizabeth, was there any other part to your question? No. Um, there are some resources, it sounds like, through 
SPAN and special child health services that could help you. Um, okay. I appreciate you your know help. What? Go ahead. You know what? Just just Google special child health services Gloucester. It'll come up. Okay. Hey, um, Elizabeth, I got it. So I will, I will drop it. Q&A, Margaret, by the way. I'm going to put it in the chat. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that you can find it. Thank you, Laura. Laura is one of our council members. Um, there's a few other questions in the Q and A. Uh, uh, Siva asks, "How perform care will be helpful for the kid and families? Is it only for services? Could you clarify that, Margaret? How it would be helpful? Yeah, there. I think the question is." Um, do you want to know if there's all, if it only offers services? I'm not sure what other kind of service. What other well, I mean, if you, if we go back to the flow chart, let's see, how do I do that? Um, if you look at, um, like the family support organization, um, has tons of like parent support groups. So if you... You can Google family support organization. I'm not sure what county you're from, um, but uh, they can, you know, provide things like that. If you have a child with developmental disability, special child health services, I guess I'm just not clear on what the question is, how they help families. Are you talking about financial help? Um, if um, Mercedes is answering and if Siva wants to raise her hand, maybe she can clarify. There's um, another question uh, from an anonymous attendee. I set up online family portal for perform care, but was not able to see an option for submitting the application online. What should I do? I have a six-year-old son and would love to get services as I'm always with him and too exhausted to leave home understand that completely. He doesn't uh, even do good with his dad. So um, I guess she's having problems seeing the what the application is online. Um, what be... I've understood is that, and only recently, that you can't move forward with the whole thing until you do that phone call, that intake over the phone. All right, so they they have they might have to call they have to call perform care is that what you're saying Margaret? Yes, For that's the what uh, at the beginning of the thing they said before you then that's how you get your cyber ID and that's how you can move through the application. Okay, and just remember it can't be done on a Apple computer, and certainly can't be done on your cell phone. So that's where you start it. But um, Margaret, this, this attendee said she he or she set up the online family portal yeah. but was not able to see the option for submitting an application online so once you set up through the family portal is there a i think you would include it in the slide deck um a link to where you then go for the application and, and that's where you have to put in the cyber id is that the step i've never done it and not able to do it because i you know, even Kyoko was saying that she tried to do it and then she couldn't do it with the cyber ID. Um, you know, when I talked about the website, I just said you could print out those parts of the application. So if she's trying to do it on a, on a Mac or a phone and can't do it, I mean, it's my best guess that either she doesn't have a cyber ID because I've never done an application. Um, so, so we're going to suggest you know that what the best bet would be to call perform care. Yeah, it's call, their, call it's perform care thing. back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so there's another question um, from January Barone. Um, and I, I think, okay. So her daughter is four years old, has dual diagnosis, Down syndrome and AS autism spectrum disorder. She's nonverbal and the school is providing an AT device. She's trying to get a device for the home through insurance, but insurance will not cover the same exact device at school. She received an AAC evaluation through her school, 
can perform care help with this? Uh, they may, but honestly, the school should allow her to take the device home. Does she only need to communicate in school? I would bring that up. And if, if she gets a no, I'd call spam. Okay, or, Honestly, she also should have a special child health services case manager. So special child health services might be able to help with that or ask the school. It might be something that has to go into the IEP that the device is, um, you know, transferred home uh, in the evenings and the weekends. Uh, it won't be available, obviously, after she graduates, but she's four, so she's got a long way to go. Um, so you probably want to get that um, set up now. There's another question in the chat from an anonymous attendee. I've spoken with a mother whose child recovered through getting services through Perform Care. I, I, I sense a little bit of a, a sarcasm there. <laughs> How long is the wait time um, once I submit the application? The website says 60 days, but, um, and then, you know, you that's just for being determined eligible then you have to call and request the services that you want or need. But, you know, again, you only have to do this once. One, you know, it's kind of like the lottery. You got to be in it to win it. And and and, and for the, the, the point about recovered through getting services, I mean, it is a daunting process and we hear that over and over. And it's part of the, presentation tonight um, is not just explaining, as Margaret has done so well, the application pro process, but also to hear um, your questions around the application or any frustration with the application um, so that we can continue um, to work with you and advocate for changes so that it's not such a daunting process. Um, so, and then Margaret January, um, who was talking about her four-year-old daughter and the device at school said that the, I guess the school did offer that they could take it home, but they're scared that her daughter will throw it out. Um, so that the, you know, the, the device would be. Um, I'm wondering if it's an iPad. Yeah. January, do you want to tell us what kind of device it is, if you don't mind, and see if we can't help you tease that out a little bit more. Okay. Yes, it's an iPad mini with um, Proloquo? Proloquo? Yeah, yeah. Proloquo. They usually have like cases on those that you could throw around and, you know, that happens. But, uh, but um, unfortunately, even though Perform Care helps with assistive technology, their website says something like there's a hold on that right now. They ran out of money. They they couldn't they they did open up applications, but they recently have told us that they've exhausted all their funds. Um, so one of the things we're advocating is that they add funding for that, um, but they they had to put a hold to new applications because of their funding. And then Laura writes that attainment uh, company has very strong cases for iPads, so perhaps a large, strong case would protect uh, the unit you're talking about, January. Are there any other questions or any other experiences that people want to either put in the chat or raise a hand to share? I don't see any other questions, Margaret. Are there any closing um, thoughts? Oh, my application expired. I have to restart everything over, including calling cyber. Hmm. How I believe you can't do a second cyber application. My understanding is that if it, it aged out, you need to do the paper application. Okay. 
Well, that's frustrating. Um, I do know that in our participant um, attendees tonight, I did see uh, Christine Bachter. Um, she was on a little earlier. I think she's gone now, but um, the Office of the Ombudsman for Individuals with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Um, Christine Bachter is the deputy and Paul Aronson is the um, ombudsman. They have also made themselves available to all ages, children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their families. And if you hit certain roadblocks, um, that office is also another advocate and avenue for advocacy um, uh, in, in you know, sticky situations. And I think Yoko just put their office in the chat with a link. Thank you. We have lots of quick fingers moving here tonight, folks. So you're hopefully getting um, a lot of good resources as you move through. Okay. Nothing else? No, I don't see any more questions in the, the chat or in the Q&A, Margaret. All right, well, I wanna thank everyone um, for you know signing on with us tonight. I know it's a busy time of year and uh, there will be a recording um, that you'll receive and feel free to share it with friends um, or other families that might need our help. And uh, you know, see if you can, you know, we'd love to see you in January at our next meeting online, in person. Um, and again, you know, reach out to your council uh, because, you know, some of us have been around a long time and we have a lot of knowledge that we like to share. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.